Okay. Good. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another one of our fabulous BBYO Parents programs. Um, the BBYO Parents Advisory Council, uh, which is co-chaired by myself, Kim schneider Malik, and Stacey Marlowe, advances BBYO efforts to develop and strengthen a global community of BBYO parents to provide opportunities for parents to engage both locally and nationally, to share ideas and support their teens both within BBYO and beyond. And we have had some fabulous programs and even more fabulous feedback on those programs. So do please continue to join us. Throughout the year, the Parent Advisory Council hosts a whole series of these programs and webinars for the BBYO parent community uniquely. Um, parents and experts share their insights through um, expert sharing content and parents asking questions, and we're all learning from each other. And there are recordings of all these past events. If you look at the bbyo.org slash Parent Advisory Council, and we encourage all of you to do that and participate with us. So um, as I mentioned, I'm Kim schneider Malik, and I'm a parent of two active juniors that are on the regional board in the Rocky Mountain region and one alum. And I, um, my co-chair is not able to be here tonight. Stacy Marlowe is the parent of two alums and one junior as well that and is in the New Jersey region. Um, and so we are, New Jersey, Rebecca, I think it's New Jersey. Um, She's in our York. Hudson Valley region. <laughs> yeah, Hudson Valley, sorry about that. So what we want to do tonight is introduce you to a speaker we've had on our radar for a very long time. And Dana Ponsky is both an independent and a school-based college counselor who began her career in education and advocacy more than 20 years ago. After working at the University of Michigan, University of Miami, and Barry University creating orientation and first year experience programs, Dana transitioned to work as a school-based college counselor in Jewish day schools. She has served as a high school director of college counseling in Miami, Washington, DC, Brooklyn, and Northern New Jersey, and has volunteered for nationally recognized college access programs. Today, Dana works closely with high school and college students and their families to guide them to create an authentic application to get into college. And we all know how important that is. While providing advice to ensure long-term success in college and beyond. She is the creator of the Facebook group called Being Jewish in College. And don't we need that right now? And developed the video series Kibbutz in 10 Minutes with Jewish life leaders on campuses across the country who share independent important information for prospective college students and families. After her presentation, Dana looks forward to taking your questions. So please submit those questions to our staff attendee under the questions for Dana tab on your screen and we'll get to as many as we possibly can. And finally, before I turn it over to you, Dana, Dana does have a handout that we will email to everybody or some form of social ac social media access. So please um, recognize she's going to be sharing with us fantastic information and she'll give us the written content of how to go find more. So um, with that, Dana, I'll turn it over to you and welcome to our program. We're so glad you're here and all of you parents, we're so glad you're joining us. Thank you everyone so much. It's been a long time coming. I was originally to do this back in October, um, but things have changed since then. And so I'm really excited to be able to do this now. And I'm really happy to be here. And I'm just grateful for this opportunity to be able to speak with everyone tonight. Um, so the topic of that we're going to talk about is creating a positive college journey for Jewish students. Um, as Kim mentioned, I've done this work for over 15 years now. Um, I love it. I was always a, a kind of a student of college. I went to college at the University of Maryland and thought, wow, this is super fun. I could do this for the rest of my life. 
I will admit working for colleges and going to colleges are very different things, but I am very much about helping students, you know, find a great journey for themselves. And, and I think that, you know, there's a lot of opportunities and experiences for students to have. And, and I've worked predominantly with Jewish students and families over the years. And so um, I'm happy to be able to kind of share my experiences, my knowledge, um, because we are a, as a group, a very diverse community, but we have very unique needs. And so I think it's really important to address those to ensure that st all students can have um, the kind of success that they're, they're working so hard to achieve. To get us going, I you've kind of heard the spiel already about who I am, um, but again, Dana Ponsky, I've uh, been a college counselor 15 plus years, was on the university side, but I have focused a lot on Jewish day schools, having been in predominantly modern Orthodox Jewish day schools. And, and usually my students would say to me, oh, Ms. Ponsky, are you Jewish? And I'd say, I am, but not your kind. And so I have a very, you know, a wide range of experiences working with students from those who identify as cultural, but not religious, to students who identify as Orthodox and being able to help them navigate the college admissions process. Um, in terms of something that I find incredibly important in my work is sharing knowledge and not just sharing knowledge, you know, to students and families that I work with both in and out of school, but also just the community of college counselors, community of independent college counselors, um, educators at large and in, in many different capacities, because I feel that there's one thing to understand college, but there's another thing to understand the needs of Jewish students. And so it's really um, important for me to be able to share that. And I do so, um, as Kim mentioned, with, um, I have a social media page um, with, with Facebook, Being Jewish in College. I did create a video series on YouTube called Kibitz in 10 Minutes, which was my way of trying to reduce some of the misinformation that exists out there about Jewish life on campuses. And I wanted to highlight some really great programs that happen for students um, and families on college campuses around the country from colleges that students recognize to ones that they might not. Um, so they're really great interviews. Um, most recently, I was the director of college counseling at the Idea School in Northern New Jersey, which was the country's first modern orthodox project-based learning high school. I was able to create their office, and so I've been able, uh, their college counseling office, and so I was able to help students in a brand new school really navigate the admissions process while trying to be able to articulate what a project-based learning curriculum was all about. And I currently am serving as the college advisor for uh, Nishmat Adim, which is in Scottsdale, Arizona, um, which is a the kind of an extension of Shell Hevet in Los Angeles. Uh, they had a partnership, but I work with them. So I'm doing remote college counseling. So I really try to help students in many different capacities and help families um, you know, across the country and even overseas because I feel like there's just so much great information out there and I'm constantly looking for ways to share that knowledge. So tonight, um, I'm going to do my best to to punch to put a lot of information in, but I also don't want to talk too too fast because I'm an expert of doing that. Nevertheless, I want to go ahead and talk about and explore and just talk about college admissions in general because there's a lot that just anybody needs to know about college admissions that I think is is helpful. But then more specifically, how students who identify as Jewish can kind of analyze and explore admissions through that particular lens. And I'll also talk about factors that can impact students and families. And a lot of those can be will be addressed in some of the content, but also in a lot of the questions that many of you went ahead and shared when you registered for the event. So hopefully I'll be able to cover as much content as I can in the next 30 minutes or so, so that we can you can feel like you're walking away um, kind of having both reassurance of information you're getting, but hopefully new information as well to help you and your students. So one of the things I like to share, I'm not a huge data person. I can't say that like my stats class in high school and college was my favorite subject, but nevertheless, um, statistics is pretty important when doing college admissions work. And the data does speak quite a bit about how this process is both um, sometimes very revealing and, and pretty straightforward. And other times we just really have no way to gauge things. 
But one of the things I found is that the National Association for College Admissions Counseling, which is known as NACAC, NACAC provides some really great research information and resources. And one of the documents they came out with most recently was this here, which I hopefully everyone can read. I know it's sometimes a little bit small, but it's essentially the percentage of colleges that attribute considerable importance to factors in the admissions decision. Typically this was done each year, but just for that given year. And they've created this new chart that kind of shows the evolution of admissions over the last 10 years for factors that are important. And so one of the things that's helpful for everyone to understand is that consistently in higher education and in college admissions, there are three factors that have always kind of remained the most important in the admissions process. And that is high school grades in the college prep courses that students take, the total high school grades, so the overall course grades, including gym and art and technology courses or driver's ed even, just all of the classes that students take, and the strength of the high school curriculum, which oftentimes is kind of referred to by the term of rigor. And essentially, these are the three factors that have consistently over the last 10 years remained as the factors that are most important in the college admissions process. And so when I'm working with students, more often than not, I say the most important factors have to be how are you doing in school? It's not about whether or not you're getting A pluses in every class, but it's really looking at it from, are you taking the curriculum that's providing you a really good balance of challenge along with the right amount of support? Because when we have students who are overwhelmed with challenge without the support, they're not doing super well academically. And sometimes we have students who have too much support and not enough challenge, and they're not necessarily enhancing their intellectual curiosity. They're not necessarily understanding content um, at a level that's preparing them well for, for the next chapter in their lives. But generally speaking, high school grades and the rigor of the curriculum are the three most important factors. You'll see now, if you look in on the category that says 2023, you'll notice that the next kind of most important factor is the essay. And this is because the essay still plays a large important role, not for every college, but for many of them, because it gives the colleges the opportunity to really understand who students are. Who are they? How are they thinking? What are some of their life experiences? So, you know, a lot of people will talk about students have to write at a really high level in order to be able to get into school. My argument is no, students have to be able to write at a high school level to show that they can talk about themselves and present a strong personal narrative so that it kind of acts as a window to their soul. Because I always say to my students, you are more than a bunch of numbers. You are more than a grade on a transcript or a test score. You have you know, interest in talents and, and, and experiences and opportunities that you have had that have stories that are important to share. And colleges, many of them who are holistic in their admissions process are very interested in the essay. So it does play a very important factor. You'll also notice students interest in attending, which is known as demonstrated interest. That does play an important role for many schools and that can come in the form of tours, information ses sessions, uh, campus visits, um, checking out a website, going and going to visit a school at a college fair. There's a lot of different ways to show demonstrated interest. Then you'll notice there's the recommendations and extracurricular activities all playing an important part in the admissions process. Now, the fun one. If you notice towards the bottom, you'll see admissions test scores. And if you look in 2023, you'll notice that it's about 5% of the colleges in the survey will have a say that testing is a, plays a considerable importance in this process. But take notice between 2012 and 2018, you will take notice that it used to be the third or it used to fall third or fourth on the list of considerable importance at the admissions process. Obviously since COVID, so 2020, the role of admissions testing has changed substantially in this process. And you're gonna start seeing over the course of the next few months that many schools that chose to be test optional 
which is the opportunity for students to choose whether or not they want to use testing as part of their process, has kind of about 2,000 schools in this country don't need testing as part of their process. And in doing so, it has made testing much less important in the, in the overall factors that are important for admission. However, you're going to start hearing about, and I'm sure many of you have, that schools like yesterday, University of Texas at Austin, is now going to require testing again. We have some of the Ivy League schools who've come back, Brown, uh, Dartmouth, who are coming back to say they would are now going to be using testing because they're concerned about the factors like grades, curriculum, particularly because there has been a lot of grade inflation that has taken place over the last few years, um, just because there's a lot been going on the last few years. Nevertheless, you will have you will have um, entire state systems like the university system. They will remain test blind, meaning even if a student submits a test score, no one's ever going to look at it. So it's really going, I think the landscape for admissions testing is going to change a lot over the next couple of years. And I think it's going to probably increase in terms of playing in, in terms of its level of importance. But my theory is, is that it's never going to play as much importance as it once did. But so I do think it's, I think in, if this chart comes out another couple of years, I think admissions testing will probably fall similarly to where you might see essays and students demonstrated interest. So when thinking about the college process, I always kind of break it down to the five Ps, person, place, programs, people, and price. These to me are kind of the five things that I try to encourage all of my students to think about when they are kind of deciding what is going to be the right fit for them when it comes to school. And I think part, part of understanding person is really asking students, who are they? What are their strengths? What are their limitations? What are their interests? What are their experiences? Essentially, what makes them them? And I think oftentimes, and I, I had this conversation today with a student where I said, you can work really, really hard to create an entire high school experience to fit what you think you what you think a college might want. Or you can spend your high school experience being authentic and having experiences that make it that you are able to know and value who you are as a person during that time. So it's really about the high school process working for, I mean, the college process working for you or you working for the college process. So in this case, I think it's really important to sit with your students and talk about what are their likes? What are their dislikes? What are their favorite subjects? What are their least favorite subjects? And add in that why component. Why are they your likes? Why are they your favorites or your least favorite? And really having your student grow to understand who are they as a person and not and separate that out from who are they as a student. So I think because there's a subtle nuance between those two things. Um, in terms of place, you know, there's 3,000 schools in this country, like I said, and there's I and I was just saying earlier, every single one of your students will get into many of those 3,000 schools, probably a majority of them. But nevertheless, there are so many schools and you can't apply to 100 and 150 or 200 schools. It really is, most students are applying between eight and 15 schools. And so place is a really important pa um, part of this because you have to think about where is the student going to be able to achieve their short and long-term goals? And more so, where are they going to thrive? Because it's not just, applying to college is not just getting into college, it's actually thriving once you're there. Because this is an expensive venture. And I, I think that if you're gonna put all this effort into getting in, we gotta make sure you get through it. And so I think that focusing on the place and the factors and characteristics of the institution that really meet the student where they're at, particularly as a person. If you know, if you're at a school and you're thinking, I don't want to be in a competitive environment, well then not necessarily you don't necessarily want to look for a school that is known to have a competitive culture. And so it's kind of finding those that commonality between the two that's going to be really important. In addition to that, programs. What programs need to exist in order for a student to feel like their goals can be met? And those programs don't necessarily have to be um, 
you know, academic programs. They can be social. They can be athletic. They could be um, performing arts. They could be volunteering, leadership. There's so many different types of programs. They can also be learning support programs where if your student has a disability or some academic need or challenge, they can go ahead and get those supports in place to make it that this is a place that can help them achieve their specific goals. So it's not just the name of a school and some of its characteristics, it's what can provide you the support you need to be able to thrive. And that kind of leads also into the people. What are the resources? Who are, what are the personnel resources? And also the student body makeup that's going to be available to support students. For Jewish students, that very much is, for a lot of students, it's, do I wanna be a party of one? Do I wanna be on a college campus where I maybe turn to my left and right and there is no other Jewish student. For some students, that's okay. But for many Jewish students that I work with, they don't want to be a party of one or they've never had that experience before. They don't know what it's like to potentially be the first time that a, a student has never met another Jewish student. And so you have to think about, or sometimes I work with students and say, what are the resources you need in place? And what are they gonna be? The academic ones, the social, emotional, anything that's gonna be needed to help you kind of get through the experience. And finally, the, fi the last one is price. We cannot ignore the fact that higher education in this country is ridiculously overpriced. <laughs> it is, you know, I wish it was a right rather than a privilege, but we kind of can only do, we can only work with what we have essentially. And so in this particular case, the cost of college is very, very expensive, but there are really great opportunities out there for students to be able to have an affordable college experience that can help them achieve their goals. But nevertheless, it is important that price is part of the decision making on how colleges are kind of making the final list. Because I always say to a parent, if, if you're not able to retire <laughs> at the time you want to, so your child can be able to get through college, we've got to sit back and, and look at that as part of this process. And so I always say, don't ignore that final P with price because it, it does have to be an important factor in what you're choosing to do. In terms of Jewish life considerations, um, programming throughout the year. This I think is really important for a lot of families, especially for students who are actively involved in organizations like BBYO or any other youth group organization or Jewish student group in their high school. Knowing that, they're, or, or just their synagogue in general, if there's programming throughout the year, it's really important for students to understand that they wanna ask those kind of questions. They wanna know, are there going to be, you know, Shabbat dinners? Are there going to be social gatherings for our, uh, for students to be able to participate in? Are there going to be Jewish leadership opportunities? Are there any advocacy programs? Are there going to be bagel breaks? Like they get sometimes in Jewish day schools, bagel breaks is like a big thing. Who knew? Um, but if they're, if, you know, sometimes they'll have events on campus where they're just going to be able to be like, hey, I can get some bagels and locks. You know, a lot of campuses seem to like pro like to promote that. So I really encourage students to think about the kind of programming that they would want to participate in. In terms of Jewish life considerations, academic offerings. Not every college has this, but oftentimes I hear families ask, is there Jewish studies? Are there Hebrew language courses? Are there any opportunities for me to be able to participate in academic offerings that I can connect with maybe things I learned when I was in religious school. Or if you had, you know, some students who go through the confirmation process later on in high school really enjoy the studying of, of Jewish studies, Jewish history. Some campuses have offerings, some don't. Some students want to be able to learn languages. Some campuses have that, some don't. But I do think it's important to talk with your students about how does, if they're in terms of their Jewish identity, how do they want that rec, um, realized or in the academic experience? Some do, some don't, but it is good and worthwhile to ask. Food, it's kind of important. You kind of need it at least a few times a day. Um, I've written an entire essay and blog post once about the importance of food. Um, I always joke that the reason I landed at the University of Maryland almost 30 years ago is they gave the most amazing cookie on the tour, and that was really the game changer for me. 
Um, so I do talk about food with the students quite a bit because it is something that they're doing quite often and they kind of need to, you know, have access to. So if your student is used to being kosher at home, talk with your student about what that means when you're on campus. Because while there are colleges that have very large student bodies with um, the Jewish student bodies, many of those campuses don't have kosher food readily available. If your student is, in, if you have a home and your student is used to having their home being kosher, talk to them. What does that mean if the dining hall, which is now their new home on campus, what happens if it doesn't, if it's not kosher? Are they going to be okay with that? And talk and looking for options and opportunities where kosher meal plans are acceptable or accept, I'm sorry, are available, not acceptable, are available if that's important to you. Oftentimes I'll have students who might mention topics like, well, I'm not kosher, but I, but when like Passover comes along, I definitely don't eat any, you know, I won't eat any bread or I won't eat pasta. Talk with your, talking with your students about what the holidays look like and how their ability and access to that and asking those questions when you're on campuses are important because again, students when they're going to campus might think, oh, if I've grown up in this particular community or in my household, we do certain things. Sometimes they take for granted that that doesn't, that they think it exists elsewhere. It's really important to find out what the food situation is because it's something they do often. And it is, to me, it's a very important part of the college experience because a Nutritious experience in college usually benefits them in the classroom as well. In terms of the high holidays, Passover, where does your student go? You know, is there going to be um, services available for students? Oftentimes students will say, oh, when it's a high holiday, I'm planning on going home. Well, what does that mean if the campus community doesn't close down for a high holiday? Or what does it mean if you're a five, six hour flight away and you've got to cross the country to get home in order to be able to participate in high holidays because that's an important part of the family, but you're now going to be missing classes. So it's really important to talk with your student about what that looks like when the holidays do come and how to make that work. Because I think oftentimes students assume that colleges are going to be overly accommodating. And while generally many schools will say during a high holiday, you know, you, you, there won't be any tests or quizzes. Remember, at institutions, faculty are kind of like on their own planets. They do what they want. Now, granted, most institutions do a good job of trying to encourage faculty to ensure that there's not testing on holidays, but nevertheless, sometimes it happens. So it is important to kind of help your student recognize when that happens, find out where they need to go on campus to navigate that situation and advocate for themselves, but also just as a family, what are your expectations? If you want your student to attend services, where are those gonna be available? Are they on campus, off campus? That sort of thing. Something else that I oftentimes talk about with Jewish students is the, the difference between the quality of Jewish life versus the quantity of Jewish students. I think oftentimes we perceive that if there is a campus with 35,000 students and 20% of that campus are students who identify as Jewish, the quantity is there. That's a, that's a huge population of Jewish students on campus, but it doesn't necessarily mean that the quality of Jewish life will match what the student expects. It looks very different on every campus. And so you'll oftentimes see lists of, you know, the top 60 college for Jewish students. And these are schools that have a large population, but there's a difference between quantity and then the quality. And the quality is determined on an individual basis. So I think when you visit campuses and when you're learning about how to support Jewish students, I think those there's the delineation of just because a campus has a lot of Jewish students, that doesn't necessarily mean they have all the resources, they have all of the food options that your student might be wanting in order to be able to live you know, in a way that I honors their Jewish identity. And I think now more than any other time in the last many years, the political and social justice climate is something that I know is very much at the forefront of families' minds. 
And so I think that for everyone, it is a very individualized experience how to manage or think about issues about anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, BDS movements. There's, there's a lot going on. And I don't know if there's many campuses that are immune to what is happening. But nevertheless, I'm very much about that every student and every family has to determine for themselves what is safe, what is something that they can tolerate, um, what is what are just no-goes. And I think that there are definitely resources available to help students navigate this, both through organizations like BBYO, through organizations like Tribe Talk, which I'll talk about in a second, and also the Hillels and Chabads and, and Jewish student um, leadership on campuses are helping students navigate what's going on on their campus, how, what resources and supports are there, and also helping students to determine what is going to be a safe place for them in order for them to be able to thrive. I quickly just wanted to highlight some organizations in terms of getting involved for students whose Jewish identity is a really important part of who they are and want to have that as part of their um, high school and college experience. Obviously, you've got organizations, you know, national organizations like BBYO, USY, NCSY, Young Judea in high school. But many of those students who participate in these, you know, organizations are getting in are getting involved in organizations on campuses like Hillel International, Chabad, Aish, OUJLIC, which is part of the Orthodox Union, uh, Mayor. There's Jewish student unions on campuses where there might not be a Hillel or Chabad. There's also the Israel on Campus Coalition, as well as Greek Life. And so for students, so little of their time in college is actually spent in the classroom. Granted, they should be studying a lot. Um, so that's one thing. But nevertheless, there's you if if their Jewish identity is important and it has been in high school, the goal is to make sure that there's opportunities for them to participate in college as well. And so these are just some of the different organizations that are out there that I always encourage students to kind of connect with when they're looking into schools and seeing what opportunities are available. Because again, what you do outside of the class in college probably dictates more about your pre, your professional preparation and helps support your success in the classroom. Um, I'd be remiss if I did not talk about gap years. So I'm gonna just spend another few minutes with this. Gap year and studying abroad to me is a really important part or can be an important part of the college experience. You know, um, it's particularly in the Orthodox community, taking a gap year is kind of a part of the college process, but more and more students are really taking advantage of gap years. And um, for many of you who may not know, Israel has a pretty fantastic infrastructure when it comes to gap year programs that are academic in nature, um, career oriented, service oriented, there's religious ones, there's many different fact, uh, many different opportunities that are available. And colleges love gap year programs. They like because they find that students who participate in gap year programs typically come back more mature. They have a stronger direction or an understanding of what their purpose is while in college. Um, they actually find that the retention of those students once they come to campus is pretty high, um, and that's an important factor for colleges. And so, I while there's, you know, I always think promoting Israel and the, you know, being able to travel there and to really embrace the culture and the experience, I think is really a meaningful opportunity. I think that there's also wonderful opportunities in the United States that students can participate in. AmeriCorps, which is the essentially the Peace Corps, but in the United States, is a wonderful option for students. Um, they do earn um, uh, educational grants from the government. You can get paid for them. So there's just a lot of different really beneficial um, programs that are out there. Uh, but in Misa Israel, which is the umbrella organization through the Israeli government, oversees a majority of the secular and many of the religious uh, gap year programs that are available there. And so I always just encourage students to learn more about what's available to kind of see how that can be a part of their academic experience in college. 
Um, these are just a couple resources. Again, I'm going to go ahead and hopefully share a document after the meeting that's going to give website links to all everything I've mentioned here. But Tribe Talk um, is based out of Boston. It started a few years ago, and they are just a just a just tons of really great information in terms of supporting students getting into college, but actually once they're there. Uh, they do a lot of work in terms of helping students with advocacy, helping students connect to other Jewish students once they're on campuses, and they just have a lot of really great resources that I highly recommend people reach out to. Hillel International is another, you know, really well-resourced organization specifically for their Hillel supports on campus um, with the different organizations. The Jewish Learning Initiative on campus, again, is run by the Orthodox Union. So there's on many campuses, there is usually a rabbi and a rebbitzin who live on who live right off of campus and do support the Jewish student body um, in various ways, socially, religiously. So that's another opportunity to learn more about um, resources that are available um, you know, for students. And you don't have to be Orthodox to participate in those programs. And one other thing I'll mention is JELF, which is the Jewish Educational Loan Fund. This is for families that might need um, uh, financial support in addition to whatever is available from you know, the federal government or from institutions. The Jewish Education Loan Fund is not available everywhere, but it is in, it's, there is many different chapters throughout the country. Um, they are no interest loans because Jews can't charge Jews loan, um, interest. And so the Jewish Educational Loan Fund does provide um, loans to students and families uh, to help with the support for college. So I encourage families to reach out to them if they need additional support. And now I think I kept it. I think I did good, Rebecca. Yeah, <laughs> you, did got great. There. you did great. Yeah. Thank you. Can you hear me okay, Dana? Yes, I can. I can. Okay, great. Yeah. We have a couple of questions that came in through um, through the registration and then we'll open it up to the chat questions on the screen. Perfect. So one is beyond what you said about the admissions process, which we know is quite challenging and also presents many, many opportunities. Yeah. Are there specific challenges and opportunities for Jewish students in the college admissions process that, that parents should be aware of, including the parents' behavior as well? Because <laughs> I think that may be one of the challenges is minding our own uh, minding uh, or attending to our unique role in this without overstepping. And um, so the, some of those challenges you might talk about. So I think I don't, you know, it's funny. I kind of see them as there are certain challenges, but I really try to flip it and turn that to there's so many amazing opportunities for students to really demonstrate especially in the latter part of high school, start to begin demonstrating their maturity to be able to manage and handle what the college admissions process has to provide. I say this is that there is, the college admissions process can seem to be very overwhelming, but it's not that hard. It's one, the hardest part is basically taking 3000 schools and narrowing it down to a, a nice list that students can work with. But with that being said, I think what has to happen is that the most successful college admissions process that I find students go through is when they begin to take ownership of the experience. And when they choose to take ownership and when, when families support them in the effort of doing that. There is an analogy I like to give that when I'm working with students, I say to families, we're on a cruise ship and the student is the captain and I am their first mate as their college counselor, whether in school or independently. And parents are the Lido deck passengers. They're the ones who sit on the Lido deck underneath the umbrella. Maybe they have a nice, you know, beverage in hand or they're eating some really good food while they're on this journey. They're on the journey with the student, but they're not in, they're not in the bridge making sure that boat, get, boat gets across the water. The student is the one who does that. And this is a really great opportunity to allow students the freedom to realize that, yeah, you could be charting a path and yeah, there might be an iceberg, but that's where teachers, college counselors, sometimes you can help a student get around the iceberg. But generally speaking, most students don't hit those icebergs. And I, okay, think, that, and I think that's where the opportunities come is really letting students 
own this process. And if they're not ready to own it, that's also an opportunity to step back and say, are they ready for the college process? And that's Excellent. where sometimes gap years can come into play that it, it, just those opportunities because college can be a part for everyone's situation, but it doesn't always have to happen at the same time. Okay. And then another question that came in, and I've heard this on a lot of different um, college admissions talks, both Jew Jewish oriented and on uh, Jewishly oriented. With the current climate, how much should students talk about their Jewish involvement and leadership in their personal statements and essays? And does this answer change when naming involvement with Israel specifically? So I'll share with you, when I went to uh, a program two years ago for Tulane, hmm. and the woman who was giving the program was not Jewish, but she did mention that because it's, quote, called Jew Lane, it's probably best for you not to highlight your Jewish leadership because you will absolutely not stand out. So that was pre-October 7th. So how might we address that and have a different feeling than I had when I left there? I am, I am philosophically, I believe that the most, I think I said this before, the most successful applications are the ones where students are authentically themselves. And if a student mm -hmm. wants to share the story of who they are, and it is, it is important to them, it's, it, it gives them pride, it gives them, it, it provides context to the choices, decisions, experiences, and opportunities they had. And if that's about being Jewish and what their Jewish identity means to them and the things they've chosen to participate in, I 100% believe that that student should talk about that, skywrite it across the board. And the reason okay. that I believe that is because that is what the, that is who the student is. And that's where if a student is being negatively evaluated by an institution for that, we go back to the old adage, is that really where you want to go to school? Students are not being rejected because of their Judaism. They are being, in many cases, they're being embraced. In many cases, are these colleges and universities diversifying their campuses? Yes, 100%. And sometimes when you might say, you know, oh, I'm coming from, they might say, okay, we need less. I'll say this, there is a university, an Ivy League, who a couple of years ago was targeting Jewish students, but only Orthodox Jewish students, you know? So there's, there's, there's priorities that every institution has, but I would never tell a student and I would never encourage a student to not reveal something about who they are and their experiences because they think a college will not see that positively. And I think it's also very important to remember that college admissions counselors across the country go through ex a lot of, bi of bias training. They are trained, they are consummate professionals who are consistently being in, trained to be able to not use any personal biases in this process. And remember, not one college leaves it up to one person to make the decision about a student. It's always multiple levels of decision-making that happens. And so I think that's really important to remember. So I tell a student, you want to you want to write it and want every inch of your application to be about your pride and being Jewish. I am 100% behind them. And I think that that's a very, I think it's what will make their application very strong. Sure. Okay. I would imagine they wouldn't want to go to a school that rejected them because of that regardless. So back to the parent situation. So one of the questions that came in relates to what you said before, but I think um, beyond that, how can parents strike a balance between offering what we want to believe is guidance and allowing our teens to make independent decisions regarding their college journey. And with that, how do we, um, if, we've ha if we have had kids who went through the college journey process pre-COVID, pre-test optional, pre all of that, how do we, when our kids tell us we don't know what we're talking about and maybe they're correct, how might we balance our own sense of self with um, our energy around allowing them to take this journey. And then of course, having a good portion of that money possibly come out of our pockets. So um, the conflicting commitment of it. Right. I think, I think one, 
remind, it's really important as a parent to remind yourself that if you've had multiple students go through this process, each one of your children are individuals and that experience, that's the, that's first and foremost, treat your child for the person that they are. Don't compare them obviously against your other student. But I think even more so you have to remember that the admissions process two years ago doesn't look like it does right now. We have to remember that, you know, we now have schools that a year, th this, this admission cycle was test optional and now is no longer. Things are constantly evolving. And I think that there is a certain level of control that you have to give up because it's a process that you're kind of just having to go with the flow. And that I know can be difficult, especially if you're just trying to get this ship to cross the water, right? But okay. I think as parents, it's going to be really important to meet your student where they're at. And if your student says, I got this, there has to be a point in which there is compromise. There is one point to say, okay, I'm going to trust you to get this part done, but give me some indication that things are moving in a good direction. Because I do think it's, I tell this to students all okay. the time, your parents are paying a bill. You know, they're paying the bill, whether it's for school or whether it's for college or whether it's for a tutor, it's okay for you, for them to ask to show some proof that there's some effort and time and energy that's gone into a process. But I think sure. also it's okay that if a student turns around and is saying, I'm doing everything, get, set expectations for them to just check in with you. But I also think that it's okay to pump the brakes if they're not meeting their expectations or your expectations, because that is more, that's less about you or them and more about that they might be doing a process that's not working for them. And that's where you kind of have to sit back and say to yourself as a parent, am I doing this because this is what we're supposed to be doing? Or are we doing this because this is the right thing for my student or my child? And I think that's okay. something that's really important. And that's why we talk about things like doing gap years for some students, or you know, there are some students who do a fifth year of high school, or there's some students who choose to... Um, Oh, I'm not sure what happened. Um, there are some students who choose to go ahead and decide that they are, um, what's the word I'm looking for? I, I was like, I just got distracted because the screen changed. But um, I think just students who are going to go ahead and decide, hey, I'm not sure college is the right for, for me right now. And I think that's okay. what's really important is checking in consistently and being okay with where your student is at and helping them along the process but doing it because it works for them, not because it works for everyone else. Okay, great. And just for the parents to know, we're taking all of your questions and adding them into common theme questions. So please continue to list what you have and we'll get to as many as possible. Um, another one that came in is, um, what is a, a unique, maybe this is one of those rapid fire questions. What is a unique application tip we wouldn't easily know as families, if you will. I was thinking about this one. I, I and and there was a few that came to mind, but there was something that I think is not talked about too often. I kind of just wanted to bring it up. And it's not it's not necessarily an application tip on what your student could do to make your application stand out. I think it's more or less something that people don't take a lot of thought about. And that is institutional priorities. And I think that people downplay the role that colleges are businesses. They are, they are trying to fill a class because they're trying to make money. They're doing that through applications. They're trying to get more applicants. They're trying to make sure that each class is filled and they're getting the most tuition dollars. And they're also trying to do really important things like diversify their class because diversification, as we know, enhances everyone and really can bolster the entire experience. And that diversification happens in gender and race and religion and socioeconomic status and gender and sexual, I mean, sexuality and everything that comes with that, food interests, anything that you want to think about. So I do think that it's important to remember that there's there is a lot about this that students are able to control in terms of the narrative that they're sharing, but there's a lot about this process that is totally out of the control of any student, any parent, any school. 
And that is simply what a board, a bunch of board members on any given campus has decided in that given year, they need to keep their doors open. How are they going to do that? And what does the class look like in order for them to have that experience? And I think that having that knowledge is sometimes comforting for a lot of students because they begin to realize that you can do everything right. And you getting not getting accepted or admitted to a university sometimes has absolutely nothing to do with you. And I think yeah. sometimes that's the ability and knowledge of understanding that that's why authenticity is important. If you have a student who at the end of the day puts together an application where they look at each where they look at the application and go, wow, I'm really proud of what I've done over the last two and a half, three and a half years. And then they press enter and, and submit. And they go, yeah, I think I did the best I could. I think that's, you've had a very successful college admissions process, no matter what the outcome is. Okay, great question. Great answer. So so others that fall into the rapid fire, you know, we can probably answer fairly quickly. Um, if someone's on a college tour, what question should they ask about fit? And how do they, subsequent to that question, um, how do they address college tours and demonstrated interests if all of these tours are a plane right away? So demonstrated interest comes in many different varieties. Majority of students who apply to college do not have the financial resources to be able to go visit campuses. So oftentimes what I do and what I encourage students to do is you may not might you might not be able to get on in a car or on a plane to go visit to a campus. But you can do virtual tours. There's a lot of really great um, resources available online where students can go ahead and do different tours um, to see what the campuses look like. Uvisit.com is a great resource to kind of have a visual of what the campus looks like. Also, signing up for information sessions, virtual ones that the colleges offer. Many of them are in person, but many of them now do them virtually as well. If any opportunity there is to kind of, you know, just kind of become intimate with the school in that way is a great way of showing demonstrated interest. I th And also when reps come to your area, go speak with them. They can give you pictures. They can go ahead and, um, you know, talk more about the campus. In terms of the college visit, when you do do them, or if you're in a session and you're asking questions, that's where it kind of goes back and at having your student think about before they begin this process, what are the things that are going to matter to them? Is thinking about the campus culture and community, thinking about the social experiences that are available, thinking about things like the food, the weather. You know, a lot of students will say, I hate the heat. And then they tell me they want to go to Miami. And I'm always like, we need to talk about geography. Because, you know, it's a little hot in Miami all year round, you know. So talking to them and understanding the factors that they think are going to be important before they start visiting the schools will help them ask the kind of questions that are more pointed and important to them. You know, if a student, if your student really likes, is, likes a competitive environment and is motivated by that, those are good questions to ask a student on a tour or ask during an info session and say, you know, is there a lot of competition in class or out of class? And and sometimes and that's a good way to gauge that. And so thinking before you get there, what are factors that are important? And then kind of asking questions related to those factors are going to be the most helpful. Okay. And and there's a there's more. We will not get to all of them just because there's a lot more coming in. Um is there some sort of list, by the way, that lists colleges and universities? That are um, that are a fr a friendly or colleges and universities that are um, uh, strong Jewish presence without you know you could have a strong Jewish you already said it strong Jewish presence and no Jewish life and you could have um, a, a strong Jewish presence presence and also a strong opposition presence. Um, is there any source a person can use to go evaluate that without it? So there is, there are efforts that are being made by college counselors in day schools and, and, and public schools, as well as independent counselors that are trying to figure out ways to kind of provide a resource to kind of help families. But I'm going to be honest, 
it's it's a really hard thing to gauge because it is not uncommon where you will hear a story come out from a particular university about something that most of us would find pretty egregious in regards to impacting the Jewish student body, where some students will say they feel very directly impacted by, and another student on the same campus might not even know it happened. And so I think that's a little bit of what the challenge is that we're facing right now. I, have, I will say that you know, on campuses that tend to have larger Jewish student bodies, they also tend to be campuses that have a, that value advocacy on any level, right? The political, political advocacy, social justice tend to be factors that are important to that campus community. So, and that is partially why Jewish students are attracted to that campus in the first place and have been historically, but is now kind of being challenged because of the situations that are taking place on campuses in regards to um, other movements that are going on. And I think that that for some students is posing a, 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 a great moral ethical you know, challenge and for other students, it doesn't matter. And I think that's where it kind of goes back to sitting down as a family and talking about what matters to the student and what matters to the family and then going onto these campuses or talking to people on the campuses and just pointedly asking, this is important to us, what is exactly happening? And I will okay. say, that I've done those videos that I had mentioned, they're 10 minutes. One of the questions I ask these campuses um, is what's the political or social justice climate like? And what are the, how does the administration react? Now, many most of these videos have were done prior to October 7th. But nevertheless, they are pretty much, they're going to be pretty comparable to what's taking place right now because administrations that were doing positive things to support Jewish students prior to October 7th are working really hard to continue on within that pathway now. And so videos like that are helpful and speaking directly to the people that are on the ground, Hillel advisors, um, directors, students that are involved in Jewish life, those would be excellent ways to. Um, those would be excellent ways to be able to kind of gauge what's going on on a campus. Okay, and the last question before we wrap up, and then we will put some information together for all of you, because there's other questions still rolling in, both yeah. on the um, private text as well. And um, so scholarships for Jewish students, is there a source real quickly that families can look to to identify that? Yes. Um, first thing is, first thing I always re recommend is Hillel International, usually in the spring of around 12th grade, will begin posting scholarships that are available throughout the country. Many of them are very specific to certain communities, but that's a really great resource to use um, because it's pointedly for Jewish students. The other thing I would recommend is walk, uh, go to your, if you're a member of your synagogue, ask what scholarships are available. There is very surprising the number of students who do not ask their, their Jewish community for financial support when there is actually a lot of resources that can oftentimes be available. I used to work, um, the idea school used to be in the uh, JCC of the Palisades in uh, in New Jersey, and they had a the JCC had a scholarship program for students, and that was for students in the entire area. So I encourage, families to think about their synagogues, think about JCCs, think about um, members of the community that are philanthropic. May oftentimes students will go ahead and reach out to them directly and say, do you provide any scholarship opportunities for college? Um, if your student is in the Jewish day school world, many times there are families within those that will help support students who might need additional financial resources, especially if the community is, is very tight. But the best place to do the, the, the scholarship researching is going to be through um, Hillel International. Um, that's where okay. I have found most beneficial. Okay. And also parents, uh, you know, Hillel just came out with their top 60 for to identify. They have different um, surveys they did. And so some of your questions that were about that, you can look at the Hillel resource. You can look at Hillel and BBYO and Route 1 did a... a a joint program recently where they also talked about the college admission process. So um, Dana, we really want to thank you. I'm sorry we ran yeah. out of time. There were so many great questions that came in. 
Yeah. Um, I was like, if I could, I would stay on for a little while longer, but I know everybody's got to go, but um, I'm happy to, I, it, my screen came off, but I'm going to go ahead into the chat. And if anyone has any questions, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, you can, you can find me at consultwithdana.com. Uh, so I kind of keep my website easy, but I'm happy to go ahead and, you know, field any questions in that respect. I do offer complimentary 15 minute calls if anyone is interested with that. But if you do have a question that was, you know, you, you really wanted to do it, feel free to just email me and I will do my best to get back with you within a short window of time. But um, you can find my, you can schedule a call, but you can also find my email as well as, um, other resources in addition to the videos that I do, or they're all on my website as well. Okay. Thank you so much. And thank you for sharing everything with us. And um, we will put those, that information that Dana just talked about in the chat, I believe it's going, we, uh, the consult with Dana.com. And then also keep in mind with so many alumni emerging as leaders in the college campuses and whatnot, somebody asked a question about BBYO and the connection, reach out to your BBYO It's always at the end. We always get a glitch at the end. <laughs> Might have lost Kim, but I can share what she was going to say, which is that uh, BBYO also provides a letter to college admissions officers annually um, that gets sent directly from our CEO, Matt Grossman. I just put the link to that letter in the chat. Um, you can find more about that letter there, or if you'd like to request that letter get sent to a specific university, you can do that as well. We have that list uh, on the website, um, and that comes out every year in the fall. So uh, know that a new one will be coming out for 2024 if your student is applying uh, then as well. And uh, I would give a really big thank you to Kim and to Dana. Thank you both for joining us so much. Uh, we you. hope, Kim, it looks like you're back. Um, so I'm happy to let you wrap out and, and That's close. That's okay. Down. I don't know if you can hear me. I'm calling in from Ireland, by the way. So the connection's a little glitchy. Um, anyway, we're so grateful that all the parents joined us and are able to participate. Do look online for other programs and um, keep in mind that that. We are here to grow our community. BBYO is a youth-led organization. That doesn't mean it's a parent uninvolved, unengaged organization. It's quite the opposite. So we are always open to your ideas. Please connect with us and let us know what you think might be a great way to connect. And thanks again for being here. And Dana, we're grateful for all of your offers that you extended after this. And as always, Rebecca, thank you for putting on a great program. It was, it was a Great. pleasure to be with you all. I hope everything was useful and helpful. And again, if there's anything I can do post this, don't hesitate to reach out. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Perfect.